Hello, I'm Robert Simmons, uh, author of the Book of Stones and Stones of the New Consciousness. And I'm here with Leo McPhee, the manager of Heaven and Earth. And today we're going to talk about something that I find very exciting, and it's, uh, we call it Azazeo. So I'm very excited about this too, because this is really new information that a lot of people are going to want to hear about. So let's hear the story of Azazelite and Azazeo. Okay. So there's, there's a lot to this, um, and I'll try to say it simply. Um, what I have on the table here primarily um, are a group of different sorts of Azazelite, um, and uh, all of them have been activated to what I would say is a much higher level of vibration or a much stronger level of energy. And what, uh, what has done that is a process that I kind of, I wouldn't say I stumbled onto, but it was kind of a download that happened uh, last summer, summer of 2012. Mm. Um, I was here at my house and um, uh, you know that we have uh, a labyrinth out there, a walking labyrinth in the yard that's made out of azestulite. Yes, which we'll go see later. Yeah, we will. And that labyrinth is a very powerful thing to walk through. I mean, I've known that. That's why I built it. And it was one of the, it's a funny thing because when it occurred to me to make an azestulite labyrinth, um, it was one of those things where as soon as the idea came, I suddenly felt like I was very strong urge to do it and get it done. Mm. And I found myself out there every night after work, like putting the stones out, putting more stones out, you know, hurt my back, didn't care, kept putting stones out, you know, to get this thing made. And, you know, it's been uh, something I've worked with, you know, very frequently, almost a daily basis when the weather's good mm. to go out there and walk it. And myself and lots of people, and you too, I think, yes. have had that experience. Yes, and it's very powerful. And, and it's different each time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and I feel like, you know, I get energy in my body when I walk that labyrinth. Surprisingly, it's not like turning the volume up on his Eschelite to where it's super loud. It, for me, it's more, uh, it's, highly, it's a very peaceful experience, even though it's a high energy experience. Mm. What do you think? I mean, how is it for you that way? Yeah, I think because of, you know, in a sense, having this labyrinth that's a grid of azestulite, and is it Rosophia? Rosophia is in there too, yeah. Yes, it, it's softer and it's harmonic and it feels, you know, peaceful to walk in, even though, like you said, it's high energy, but it evens it out mm -hmm. in a way. It spreads it out literally so that you can receive it and have whatever you're having at the same time. So just for people to visualize it before they actually go out with us and see it, it's a concentric set of circles with a path that winds through them all to the center. And that concentric set of circles of high energy stones, the Azestulites and the Rosophia, I feel creates a field of energy mm -hmm. so that it's not just flat where the rocks are. It's kind of like a big dome or maybe even a sphere that goes underground as well as above ground. So anybody who enters the field, if they're sensitive mm -hmm. to stones, they'll experience that. And even some people I've brought in who don't normally feel stone energies have felt the experience of that mm -hmm. in a way that they liked a lot. But that's just the sort of the foundation for this thing that happened. Yes. Um, I was thinking last summer about, is I wonder if there would be a way to uh, do something that would bring a zestulite to a higher frequency or to activate its potential more. Mm -hmm. Because even though it's probably the most powerful stone in my whole collection, you know, with maybe a couple of other uh, stars that I would put in there too, um, a zestulite, uh, it wakes people up, it stimulates their energy, it, it does a great deal, and yet I wondered if it would be possible to do more. Mm -hmm. And that, that idea just kept circulating. Like, I wonder if Azestulite is all the way complete with what its potential activation is. Mm. And then, so then it was kind of a thing of just turning that over in my mind and, and, and then it's suddenly like a picture came. And it took, it took some days. I mean, it wasn't all in one sit down. But what happened was uh, when, when I was thinking about it one afternoon here, 
I suddenly got an inner picture, which is how I get the stone energy information too. When I'm mm. meditating to write about the stones, I work with the stone and the, inner, the images that come to me are metaphors for what the story of the stone is. Mm. So this was another image. It was kind of a visionary experience. And what I saw was this labyrinth out there in the yard with a pyramid over the center. And um, then in the pyramid, I pictured some two very powerful stones for activating something that would be on a little table in the center of the pyramid. And that would be where we would put some azeshtalite to see if we could you know, bring in a higher energy. Mm -hmm. So that all kind of came in one vision with also the, the information or the urging that I choose these two stones to be the ones that were the sort of generation points for this higher level of energy to be in that environment. The labyrinth is an energy environment. The pyramid itself is an energy magnifying environment. Mm -hmm. And then the pyramid I have is a copper pyramid that's filled with Zestulite and Rosophia. So mm -hmm. it, it resonates, you know, in terms of what's in it with what's in the labyrinth. Right. So we've got, I think of the labyrinth as kind of a feminine, you know, it's, it's circular, it goes to a center point, it's kind of a receptive image mm -hmm. and I think of the pyramid as a more masculine image it's angular it's pointed it's vertical mm -hmm. so the idea of putting the pyramid in the labyrinth was to bring the masculine geometry and the feminine geometry together mm. and then within the context of that unification to bring even higher energy stones in and then in, in you know in the center of the in the very center of the pyramid above the ground a couple of feet between these two stones would be some azeshtalite that we would, uh, that I would be trying to um, encourage or awaken or you know activate mm -hmm. through the help of both the geometric forms, the stones in them, and these other activation stones. Yes. So I should say something about these. In the story of azeshtalite, um, if you remember from the other day when we talked about that. Yes. The uh, there was a phenakite used by the beings of Azeshtalite, by the Azez, to program and activate the original Azeshtalite. Yes. Which was, of course, this, the white material from Vermont and the white material from North Carolina. Yes. Um, so that was interesting to me. You know, like uh, in that story, I won't go back and tell the whole thing, but in that story, I had a big phenakite that. Um, got lost and when we my Naisha, my co author of the Book of Stones, was communicating with the beings who were indicating that Azeshtalite was going to show up in the world, mm -hmm. um, I said, Where's my phenakite to Naisha? And the Azez told her, We borrowed it. We're using it in the etheric realm to activate your Azeshtalite and we'll give it back when we're done. Which happened. Yes. So you know, that's anyone who really wants to know more should watch our Azeshtalite video. But yes, I've been a collector of phenakite for my whole career in the stone business and um, in my writing and everything. It's been a favorite. And so because of that, I've been able to get some of the biggest phenakites in the world over the course of the last 25 years. Mm. And one of them is this one. The first one I got is this one. This is an African phenakite crystal. You can see the crystal faces here mm -hmm. and it has some black tourmaline on the outside of it which you know the uh, the phenakite aspect of this which is you know 95 percent of the bulk of it is that activation of the third eye, the crown chakra, the soul star above the head and the opening up to the higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. That's kind of phenakite's thing to do and the awakening of visionary experience. Those are the things it does in me, anyway. Yes. The black tourmaline is, and just pretty much everybody's stone cosmology, purification, protection, elimination of the presence of anything negative. Yes. So when you put those two together, it's a wonderful thing to have, this high vibration, the opening to the spiritual worlds, while something that's being kept, with something that's being kept constantly pure, and clear of anything negative. Mm -hmm. So that's been my treasure for many years, probably 15, 20 years. Mm. 
last year at the Tucson show, and I know you were there for this. Yes, I was. We got this one, and this is the largest phenakite crystal in the world, I believe. Um, it's certainly the largest one I've ever seen, and the largest one anyone I know in the business has ever heard of. This weighs about 16 pounds, and uh, just to give a sense of it, you know, the normal phenakite weighs about, you know, a quarter of an ounce. Yeah. So 16 pounds in a phenakite is like, you know, 2,000 pounds is in a quartz crystal. Yes. In terms of rarity and in terms of energy, too. So this one, when we got it last year uh, at the Tucson show, um, Everybody on the crew was in love with that this stone. Yes, me included. Yeah. I was a champion of this had to come home with you. That's right, I know. Yeah, for those of you in the studio audience, my wife bought it for me for Valentine's Day because um, that's what happens when we're in Tucson every year. And uh, it was a major thing to do. It was, it was expensive, but it was I couldn't live without it. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it seemed like it was a part of my future work. Kathy told me that. That was her intuition. Yes. So the, up to the point of this vision of doing something with uh, activating his Eschelite, mostly I had just sat with this crystal and had friends sit with it, and there's this presence about this crystal as though it is kind of an ecstatic, loving, angelic critter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like there's a presence here that makes you feel like it's somebody, and that's something that's unique. I mean, I know that all the crystals are beings, and I can meet them when I go meditatively into their world. But this one, all you have to do is sit with it for a few minutes, and you feel like there's somebody there's with a you. presence there. Yeah. And it's loving. Mm -hmm. And it sort of makes you smile without even meaning to. So I'm just emphasizing how special this stone is. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the stone we place in the very center. I, you know, in the vision, I saw that this stone should be placed in the very center of the labyrinth, underneath the table that was going to hold the stones that were going to be activated, if this was going to work. Mm -hmm. And this stone in the vision was to be at the apex of the pyramid, mm -hmm. so right where the four lines come together. So kind of like, you know, this is the apex of the pyramid, here's the ground, and in the middle is going to be the table where we see if we can put some stones and if those, this will have an effect on them to put them in that environment. Now, the other part of what I did, and this kind of just all kept growing, um, was I did, I did this in ritual. Mm. Because what I was asking for, what I was feeling I was trying to ask for and intending to ask for was for the beings behind Azeshtalite, the Azez, and the Great Central Sun, which is said to be the source of where all the vibrations we get from Azeshtalite comes from, mm -hmm. to call upon all of that and ask for more, ask for a stronger infusion of whatever the currents of Azeshtalite at its highest and best me uh, way of being activated would be. Mm -hmm. Um, so that took me back to something else that I uh, put in Stones of the New Consciousness about Azeshtalite. Now, do you remember that story about the? Um, I'll tell. I mean, if you don't, I'll, no, which yeah, one? I'll tell you. This is about Azazeo. Mm. When I was researching Stones of the New Consciousness, um, I discovered that there was an old uh, Gnostic gospel, one of the ancient texts. 2,000 years old, in roughly speaking, that was found at Nag Hammadi in uh, the Middle East that had a lot of other, in, among, amid many other sacred texts. This was in 1947. Mm. And in this particular gospel was something called the Book of Eou, I-E-O-U. And that was a, a way of spelling the name Jesus without any consonants. It was all vowels. And this had something to do with the way that... Um, the particular sect of Gnostics were Gnostic Christians were interested in uh, naming him. They put him in, they put his name in that form. And there's a lot of there that I can't explain. Mm. Some because it'll take too long, some because <laughs> I don't understand it. Um, but this much I found. Um, the Book of Eu was said to be an ascension manual 
for the disciples of Christ after he ascended. So the purported um, source of this was kind of channeled. It was like the, whoever wrote the books of EU was receiving information that they believed to be coming from Christ after his ascension to heaven. Mm. And he was telling the disciples how they could ascend. And um, of course, a lot of us who are in the crystal world are interested in ascension. And to me, ascension is a vibrational change, mm -hmm. not like flying up into the air. Um, but it's like you're... Raising your frequency. Exactly. You raise your energy level until it ascends to a place where your consciousness opens up and you know worlds upon worlds become available to you. Mm -hmm. So it's as if you actually went up, but <laughs> you do it with your consciousness. So anyway, in this book, they said, uh, there, there was, it was written that during the process of ascension, the disciples would encounter some negative beings, some limiters, some challenging entities that didn't want human beings to become mm. highly conscious or to ascend. And they called them archons. And that's an ancient, that's done a lot in a lot of these ancient texts. The archons would approach and try to stop them from ascending. And in that instruction manual, the Book of Eu, the disciples were encouraged to call upon three angels to help them and to um, use a sacred word to call upon these three angels. And it's interesting because each of the three angels um, has a name that sounds like Azez. It contains syllables from the word Azez in it. Mm. I remember two of them. One of them is... Uh, uh, Chozezaza, and the other one was Zazezo. Um, but, and that one even has the word Zez right in its name. So they were to call upon them, and they were to call upon them by speaking the word Azazeo, A-Z-E-Z-E-O. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, the first four letters of that is Azez. Mm -hmm. So it just sort of exploded in my mind when I came upon this text and thought, these three beings, when I connected with the Azez myself, I saw them as three beings. Mm. And so these may be the very same beings that are referred to in the books of Eu. Mm -hmm. And calling upon them for aid in the ascension process is done by means of this sacred sound, this word, Azazeo. Mm. So I thought, I mean, I didn't think, I imaged it's, it came as a vision that in the process of trying to work to activate the stone of the Azez, the Azez mm -hmm. to a higher level, I could bring in this word. So in addition to placing the stones on the table, placing the phenakites above and below, putting up the pyramid, and, and walking the labyrinth, walking the stones into the labyrinth in a meditative state, holding the intention for their activation to another level. Mm -hmm. Doing all of that, when I got to the center with the stones and placed them on the table, I was to say Azazeo. And I, would, I even wrote the words on paper and put them on the table on the four sides for the four directions. Mm. So go to, going there, I said Azazeo, 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 four times in this ritual for the activation. Mm. And then I left, walked out the labyrinth again and left, and left them there for a day and a night. And did not know what would happen, you know, I was just following, I don't even want to call it guidance, it was like just an inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very curious, like I thought, I kind of, to be honest, I thought, this isn't going to do anything, I'm just, I'm just hoping, or I'm just following some, you know, vision, and I don't know what will happen. Mm. And, but it's interesting when it, because it did make a difference. And, you know, my experience, I had some of the white azeshalite in there the first time and some of these clear pieces of Satchaloka azeshalite on that first time. Mm -hmm. um, and did I have any others? I believe I had a piece of the golden yes. uh, Himalaya gold azeshalite yes, in there too. Yeah. So next day, walked into the labyrinth, brought the stones out and just held them to check them out. And what I felt knocked my socks off. 
because I felt immediately, all through my body, it, something that went, I'll say it like this, the normal pulse of his eschulite in me, it comes, the energy comes in a pulse, and it's kind of like, boom, boom, boom. It's about that fast going into the third eye and crown. Um, and it can go all over my body, but generally the pulse is about that speed. Mm -hmm. When I worked with this, first thing I noticed was the pulse was boom, 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 much quicker, much stronger, mm -hmm. and went completely through my body. Mm -hmm. So I thought something happened here, and it seems as though exactly what I asked for happened here. Right. And then I remember when you blindfold tested me. Right, yes, yeah, say, talk about that. Well, Robert brought me, you know, a batch of the white as astrolite, just like these, and said, here, try this, and didn't tell me anything about this whole story, this whole process. And, you know, I held it, and I'm very familiar with this energy for, you know, over the last 20 years, and it does to me have a very specific frequency um, that's notable and I'm familiar with. But when I held this activated Azazeo Azestulite, which I didn't know anything about at the time, even the name, I looked at Robert and said something like, wow, that's really intense. Yeah. And that's really, really, really strong. It's like Azestulite on steroids, I think is what I said. That's what you said. Yeah, I remember. And yeah. uh, that was the beginning of this leg of the journey. Yes. You know, yeah, and, and so I was very excited. First thing we did, as I know you remember, is we took some of this, well, we started working with more. We, you know, we brought in other kinds of azestulite. We brought in not only the uh, original Vermont and North Carolina azestulite, Sachaloka Clear, Sachalo mm -hmm. um, Himalaya Gold. I also brought in some of the New Zealand Saralite Azestulites, yes. and they received it, and it worked just the same way. Um, and some of the Amazes crystals, the Amethyst Azestulite, we did all that pretty early on. Yes. And then we took all this out to the Denver Gem Show yes. to test it out. And I know from the people, I mean, our friend Birch mm -hmm. was the first one, and he immediately got a very strong response to it, just as you did. And he's been around this for years, the Azestulite. That's right. Uh, before this activation. That's right. So there was another one, and then lots of people who had no uh, prior connection with us, who just came to the show and looked at stuff, we tried that out on them. And it, for, among the people who can feel stone energies, I would say 98% mm -hmm. of the people had an experience like we did. Yes. Yes, and it was not subtle. It was very strong and very noticeable and seemed to, on an energetic level, I could see it's like it just stood outside of everything else it did. that we had to offer in a way that was very interesting. So, you know, there's, I mean, to me, Leo, this is, and I know you know, this is um, a very big development in the crystal, in the work with crystals, mm -hmm. because up to now, I haven't really realized that there was any possibility of changing the energy of a crystal. And I don't mean me changing it, mm -hmm. but bringing the change to it mm -hmm. through invitation and through exposure to other stones, just the thing we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really clear that whatever, we, whatever was done in this process really worked in exactly the way that I'd, I'd seen that it might work and hoped it would work. Yes, and one thing I've noticed is I've been, you know, helping you get the stones together to activate with this process. I'll just randomly pick up any stone, whether it's a polished piece or a raw piece or all the different varieties, and just to kind of test it, you mm -hmm. know, from day to day. And it's, it's always the same. I mean, it's so much stronger, and what I feel like is that it, it doesn't change the energy in my experience per se. It amplifies it quantumly. Mm -hmm. It makes it so much more available and so much more palpable and assimilatable, I think, in terms of the energy. I mean, it, so it, I think it is, takes the essential quality of energy and amplifies it to, a, I don't know what degree, but it's very 
yeah strong and I've heard people say ten times yep yeah so that's just that's my testimonial to being around this for mm -hmm. the last number of months so this is you know to me implication wise like what does this tell us about what's going on with the stones I mean it, I don't even know all the things it tells us but the things that come to mind at the beginning are um, a Zestulite has more to offer than we realized. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and we named all this Azazeu, super activated Zestulite, to just describe what it is, and also to bring that word of power into play in the very name of it. Mm. Because if this is really a word of power as it was indicated in the Book of Eu, then it means that invoking it invokes the beings that were being called on, mm -hmm. which I think are the Azez themselves. Right. So it's a tying together of something from 2,000 years ago and now mm. for, the, for the same purpose, for the purpose of what I call vibrational ascension of human beings. Yes. And, you know, this is a propitious time. This is the right time in the history of the world for this to happen. Yes. Um, I mean, I, just from my perspective, it seems like, you know, we're reaching an evolutionary crisis point, And so the opportunity for things to open up in ways that they never have before is right now. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a piece of that for those who want to um, work with the stone beings as a spiritual path and as a path of their own awakening and evolution. And I think that Azazeo, Azestulite, is so far probably the strongest thing I've come up to with for doing that. Yes, and I want to add, you know, that my experience of this phenakite that's a part of the whole process that you've talked about was singularly the most powerful stone that I've ever experienced yeah. in 20 years. And so it's interesting that it would come around from that initial story of the Azez saying, we borrowed your phenakite to then you, in a sense, giving back by, you know, right. let's do this intentionally from this side of oh, things. Mm -hmm. um, and phenakite being, the, in a sense, a big part of the activation oh, of, very of much the Azezulite. So. Yeah. And so I'm just seeing the, the symmetry and the poetry of that. Yeah, that's great. And I, I do think, I'm glad you put your, your, you know, you put your attention on that because I do think that these two phenakites are key in this process. I don't know yet how much of what I did in the labyrinth is essential to the activation of these stones. Mm -hmm. My gut feeling is that one component absolutely essential are these two, you know, master crystals of phenakite, you might call them. Yes, exactly. Um, and that, you know, the presence of the other is Eschelite and the field created by the labyrinth probably helps. Yes. Um, I think without these stones, I'd be, but we don't really know, but I think without these stones, I'd be surprised if the same thing occurred. And or certainly if they were as potent or as right. potentized. Yes. Now, the other thing we did is um, we created a, an essence, too. That's right. We did. We brought some of these Azestulites uh, into a bowl and uh, put in uh, spring water from a crystal mine in Arkansas. And we um, brought these stones into play in the same way, under and above the, the table, inside the pyramid in the labyrinth, and activated this water um, with the uh, Azazeo energy. Yes. And the Azestulite energy, the combination of those. Yes. So that's something that I'm, all, I'm also, it's the, it's the only stone essence that I've immediately felt the influence of all through my body. Mm -hmm. I know others do affect people a lot, but I haven't been particularly sensitive in that way until I got this, uh, what I jokingly call Azazeo juice. Yes, yeah. yes. And it is very potent. I mean, it's made in, this, in the way that gem elixirs or gem essences are made, very simple process, but it's within the context of this whole, everything you've been describing. Mm -hmm. And it is as potent, you know, as an essence that, as the stones themselves, I feel. Yeah, yeah, and that's great because that means we can actually, you know, um, bring it into the body physically as yes. well as bringing it into the body through the currents of energy.
Yes. Now, one thing I wanted to say too, because we, we did a little more experimenting after we had done this with several kinds of azestulite, we thought, well, I wonder how many other crystals or which other crystals might be able to be more highly activated in this same process, utilizing the phenakites and the pyramid and the labyrinth. Yes. And we did. We tried out um, these, which are um, called nirvana quartz, and they are, uh, the technical term for them is growth interference quartz, um, and these have come from uh, the Himalayas in India, and it worked on them. Yes. Yes, I feel like it amplified them in a similar way as all the other azestulite. I mean, this is not an azestulite, but it's one of the highest frequency quartz crystals mm -hmm. that I've ever felt. And that Azazeo process and intention amplified these as well in a way that it was almost like waking them up. It felt like to yes, me. yes, I agree with you. And I, I think that, you know, we'll be doing more experimenting to see what else we can wake up with the Azazeo process. Um, I do, you know, these are very strong consciousness openers too. Mm -hmm. And the, I didn't name them Nirvana Quartz, but I think the name is appropriate. Yes. Because they really are uh, expansive to consciousness. And then there's these. Yes, Oralite 23. This is the other stone that we uh, worked with in the Azazeo process. And again, it worked. Um, the Oralite 23 is a pretty popular stone on in its own right these days. It emerged from Canada probably two or three years ago. Yes. Something like that. And um, I like its energy on its own. But again, putting this in that environment and doing the ritual invitation yes. to activate them to their highest potential changed them in mm -hmm. a way that feels like their highest potential. I mean, it feels like a higher potential for sure than what we felt from them before. Yes, exactly. And one thing I noticed um, with both of these, since they were sort of outside of the azestulite, you know, mix, although this is all, they're all quartz. Right. I mean, all of the azestulites are quartz and this as well. Um, and I felt like it just made it that much stronger and the name Oralite actually really hit me and that it felt like it did light up the aura you know it mm -hmm. took a minute or two but it actually felt like just fluffing out the whole <laughs> energy body with all of the complex energies that this stone carries which is up to 23 elements so it's more complex yes. Yes. energetically you know as far as what it is physically and it, I think it really benefited from this process and it's powerful so that's where we are now with this process. We've, we, we can see that all the azestulites we've tried it with have really gone up in their energy levels. And the two quartzes, the Nirvana quartz and the Oralite 23 that we tried it with also responded to it. So, you know, I, I say that this is, um, this allows, this, this opens up the idea that we will work in a co-creative way with the beings of the crystals to, uh, to enhance what they are and what they can do and be, yes, and to enhance our own beings and our own capacities, our own latent capacities for consciousness that we are just now beginning to explore more fully. Yes. That, that it's a, it's a two way street. It's kind of like, um, like a feedback loop where we're in connection with the beings behind the stones. And if we invite their deeper participation in a way uh, that is supported by a field of enhancing energy, then they're able to participate more in terms of what the energies are in the stones that we then work with. Yes, well put. And you know, this also I'm realizing is so connected to you know the precepts and stones of the new consciousness you know your book it really the underpinning is co-creation yeah i mean i think this is a really prime example of that of the two-way street mm -hmm. which is a very different way to look at you know humans relationship to crystals than you know a lot of other perspectives right i mean that's one of the things i always say is that it's relationship and if we look at it as relationship, we'll get a great more out of our work with stones. Mm. 
you know, I have, I have a relationship with you and, you know, your body is your physical manifestation of yourself. But what I have the relationship with is actually the you that dwells there. Mm. And I'd say the same for the stones, you know, what I'm experiencing is relationship. When I feel the stone current, I'm meeting the being. Yes. And it's not, this is the, this is the physical aspect of that being, but the being is something uh, invisible and more vividly present as energy than even as the physical stone. Yes. Just as we really are too. Yes. You know. So we're similar in that. And, I, and that's, that's one of the ways I'd sort of get over the hump of thinking, well, how can you have a relationship with a rock? Yeah. Um, and I noticed, I don't know if you noticed, but through this whole conversation, I kind of can't take my hands off the big phenakite. Yes. You know, yes. It's, it, it's it a is, lovely being. It's giving me just a nice feeling of uh, well-being through this whole time we've been here. So I think we've yeah, talked think about this a lot. It. I think maybe the thing to do is just to show the environment uh, where where we did the work. Yes. And um, you know, then we'll have given people a pretty good introduction to Azazeo stones. Yes. So and, and if people go to our website or our catalog, you know, the the azeschelite ones are called Azazeo super activated azeschelites. Yes. And then the other ones, like Nirvana Quartz and Oralite, are called uh, Azazeo Activated Crystals. Just so people know the distinction. Exactly. So you can find you know, more information and be able to get these stones at heavenandearthjewelry.com. <laughs>